may makita na ito libro ha ang nagparang Welcome again to this webisode on the monastic life. This series of conferences I'm giving to you purport to help build a life of seeking God and His kingdom. And the life of seeking God and His kingdom has eight aspects. We have already finished the first four aspects of this life which seeks God and His kingdom. The first was spirit life in terms of God's calling the vocation of the monk to seek God and his response to such a call. Then we said that the self-dedication of a monk to God is also a dedication to prayer, to the exclusivism of prayer. And so we looked into the prayer life of the monk. But his vocation and his life of prayer cannot be sustained without discipline. Personal discipline, which uh, embraces his bodily dimensions, his mental dimensions, and spiritual dimension, as well as social discipline. And yesterday, we look into the community life of monks, and we saw uh, 13 aspects of this community life. First, concerning the rank in the community, so community rank. Then we talked about the material goods of the community with emphasis on the principle that private ownership is absolutely uprooted and removed and no one may presume to have anything and not even his body is his own. And of course, monks have to eat. And so we took a look into the food of the monks. They also have to sleep like all human beings. And so we took a look at the sleeping regime of the monks. And particularly, they have to work. And their work is manual labor. And they have to spend hours and hours in the field working for their own self-subsistence for the uh, meager, meager needs of the community, the monks. And uh, whatever is left over and behind their needs, they're given out for the alleviation of the misery of others. And so we, in previous conferences, we gave some principles of the work. We 
we said that monks are truly monks when they lived from the labor of their their hands from the sweat of their brows we also said something about their clothing and their working clothes and footwear and then very important in the life of the community of monks is the Lectio Divina, reading. So if they are not working, or if they are not at the chapel praying the divine office, they have to do Lectio Divina. Then we said something about the chapel, the oratory, which is uh, uh, the place of prayer and uh, nothing else is to be done there and to be kept there. We also discuss the leaders of the community. The top leadership is the abbot, followed by the prior, and then the deans, if the community is built, the cellarer, then the porter, and the seniors. While monks, even if they live outside the framework of societal living, have time and again have to contend with external affairs. Because time and again people go to the monastery, and time and again the monks have to do some business outside the monastery. So we gave some rules. And uh, in, on matters of journeying, we also gave some rules according to Benedict. When to eat, when not to eat, and what to say and what not to say after coming from the world. And then their work assignments. Every day they have to receive work assignments from the monk who is in charge of the works of the monastery. And the longest part of this community life are the uh, rules governing fraternal relationships and I mentioned to you 13 yesterday but uh, we said that Benedict is concerned why things are done and how they are done and motivation behind monastic observances is the object of his interest and what is this motivation? individual submission to the action of grace within the monk. We go now to the fifth element of the life of seeking God and His kingdom, and that is the formation, the formation life. Let's uh, take a look at how Benedict envisioned the formation, which was much, much simpler than the formation we have now. First, he has a, a one-year program, one-year program of formation, divided into two uh, sections, into two parts. And the first is the four or five days at the guest house. Now, Benedict gives three basic principles to be followed before accepting the applicant. The first principle is make admission difficult. Part that. Make admission difficult. Oh, well, today, uh, vocation campaigns are very enticing. I know one day of Sisan priest as he uh, 
convince us young people, young boys to enter the seminary high school and he says, if you enter the seminary, you will become rich. Nonsense. I know a religious congregation. Join us and you will see the world. Oh my. If the motivation is to go around the world and to see the world, uh, what kind of religious will you have? Some uh, college students, uh, a religious congregation which owns a school, a university, they say, join us and your four-year college will be free because you will study at the university owned, owned by our congregation. Another nonsense. So the basic principle and the first principle for Benedict, make admission difficult. That's the first principle. Actually, in the prologue of the rule, Benedict says, the way the monastic way of life is rough and tough. So make admission difficult. Then, the second principle, he devises a genuine test of perseverance and persistence. What does Benedict say? Well, the applicant let him stay at the guest area and let him knock and knock and knock and knock and knock and maybe for the first days you ignore him. We'll see whether he will persevere or, or not, whether he persists in knocking at the door or not. So genuine uh, test of perseverance and uh, persistence then finally, the third, which is the most important for Benedict, make a searching examination of the man and his motive for coming. A searching, a searching examination of the man and his motive for coming. Why is he coming to the monastery? I think I shared with you one experience I had at the Trappist Monastery in Guimaras. I was tasked to receive the letters of applicants and to answer them. Of course, I have to show my, my answer to the superior. And one priest uh, wrote a letter of application and he wanted to join the Trappist Monastery and his motivation was to write books you don't enter a monastery to write books. And in my mind I said, does he think that he is another Thomas Merton? So, make a searching examination of the man and his motives for coming. And only then may he be admitted and made to stay at the guest house for three to five days. Three to five days. Now how Benedict uh, devised the examination of the man and uh, his motives for coming, I suppose they just did it by way of talking and dialogue with the applicant. So that's the first part of the one year program, four or five days at the guest area. After making it difficult for the applicant to, to enter and then after devising or 
a genuine test of his perseverance and persistence and after an examination of the man and of his motives for coming. Then starts the one full year program. So the next step then is to let the applicant stay in the monastery for one uninterrupted year. One uninterrupted year. And this one uninterrupted year is divided into three stages, three phases. The first phase is made up of two months during which he reads and studies the rule. So he's given a copy of the rule of Benedict. So for those uh, uh, two months, he reads the rule and studies the rule to know precisely what obligations he is undertaking. I remember uh, this is an experience with the superior of the community and myself, Mother Alexis, a St. Paul sister, was uh, going to start a kind of a contemplative community for girls, which uh, initially was uh, conceived as the female uh, counterpart of the Trappist, the Trappistines. And Mother Alexis was staying in the house of the sister of Father Superior, which was about a kilometer or so away from the monastery. And Mother Alexis would come to the monastery at uh, uh, determined days and uh, Father Superior and myself and she, we would study the rule together. And I think one, uh, one way of letting my superior uh, and leading me to, to know the role at depth, he asked me to, to facilitate the, the sharing. So the candidate, the applicant, the candidate stays in and he, re ruled, he reads and studies the rules so he will know precisely what he's getting into. Now, the purpose of uh, the, the candidate in studying the rule and reading the rule is to prepare him to make a decision. A decision to commit his life to the monastic life with full knowledge, full knowledge. with uh, much reflection and freedom. Yeah, by the way, the, I have written this booklet, Psalm 73. It's uh, short. It has uh, 51 pages and uh, this is my uh, study paraphrase of the rule and so the, the candidate has to uh, study and read the rule to prepare himself to make a decision to commit his life to the monastic way of life with full knowledge, reflection, and freedom. And at the end of the two-month initial period, he makes a first promise. First promise. A decision to stay and to persevere 
through the novitiate to professions. That's, that's the first promise. So there was someone who came only lately. At the end of the fourth month, he decided to leave. And he said he has no monastic vocation. And for the three years, he had been sort of aspiring. And he was insisting that he had a monastic vocation, that he was ready to commit himself. After four months, he left. But Benedict gave the candidate only two months. But these two months are intensive study of the rule in order that he will know what he is committing himself to. And so at the end of the two months, he makes a promise. And the promise is a decision to stay and to persevere through the novitiate until profession. Now the second phase of the one-year program is six-month period. And during this period of six months, he reads in depth the role of Benedict. He reads in depth the rule of Benedict. Or maybe he, he might want to keep a journal of reflection, or uh, his insights on the rule. And he takes up these reflections and insights with the uh, one in charge of him in charge of the aspirants. So the six-month period is an in-depth study of the rule. So now the candidate has finished eight months. The third phase is the four-month period. And this is the time to reflect on the monastic life as lived in that community. And at the end of the four month period, he makes a second promise, so a second promise in which he states his firm determination to observe everything and to obey every command given him. Firm determination. The phrase used by St. Therese of Jesus is determinación determinada, a determined determination. Because one can make a determination which is rather weak or shaky, not really firm and determined. More concretely, he promises stability and obedience that make up the elements of perseverance. By the way, uh, a friend has been uh, monitoring my my programs, which are now at the YouTube, and uh, I invite you to to go through the to go to the YouTube and to uh, subscribe, because uh, we would need one thousand subscriptions to be able to go live to the YouTube. And uh, my friend has been monitoring uh, the topics I've been discussing with you at the Facebook and now 
uh, many of them are now on the YouTube and stability is getting to the first place is getting to be the number one topic most loved by those who are following my program so the end of the four months the candidate promises stability and obedience stability and obedience make up the elements of perseverance so that's the one year program four to five days at the guest area with three basic principles observed make admission difficult devise a genuine test of perseverance and persistence and make a searching examination of the man and his motives for coming then he's accepted two months he stays in the monastery and he reads and studies the rule after the two month period he makes a decision to commit himself to this monastic life so the first promise to stay and to persevere through the novitiate and uh, profession. The second uh, phase of the uh, one full year program is uh, um, six months. The six months are given to an in-depth study of the rule of Benedict. And the last four months which constitute the third phase of the one full year of uh, formation program uh, he makes after the end of the four months a determined determination to observe everything and to obey every command given him so more concretely he makes another promise and he promises stability and obedience why stability and obedience? Because stability and obedience make up the elements of perseverance. Now after that, uh, the novitiate the novitiate while in uh, some monasteries last for one year in other monasteries two years and uh, during this novitiate period the candidate is given two years to imbibe uh, the rough and tough of the monastic life the Lectio Divina which is composed of Lectio or Meditatio Oratio and Contemplatio and then uh, during these two years of novitiate there's the development of the apprentice monk and normally this is the time for the sort of overhauling the candidate because he came from the world and he brought with him so many values so many habituations and so many attitudes that he has uh, imbibed from the world and they have to be changed So that's the novitiate. In the original rule of Saint Benedict, uh, there were no uh, ceremonies. Now the third part of the program, the formation program, is the development program and there are four areas of the development of the monk according to the rule of Saint Benedict and he 
expresses these four areas through four questions. The first is, is he truly seeking God? Truly seeking God. And the second question is, is he zealous for the Opus Dei? The Opus Dei, as uh, we have learned, is the divine office, the praying, the chanting of the divine office, or the liturgy of the hours, or the breviary. Is he zealous for the Opus Dei? And the third area is expressed in the form of a question. Is he zealous for obedience? And the fourth is, is he eager, zealous for trials? So these different areas would really constitute the development program of the candidate. Let's take the first. Is he truly seeking God? So the, the motives of the novice must be proved to be sure that he has come to the monastery for the right reason. If he goes to the monastery because he plunked in one of his subjects in college, that's not the right reason. Why does the monastery, why does Benedict insist that the motives must be proved to be sure that the candidate has come to the right reason. Oh, there is a subtle intrusion of self-deception. And hence the varieties of subconscious motivations must be recognized. Often, the young apprentice monk is unaware of his own motivations, and his intentions have to be brought into light and purified. So that's important. Maybe he did not really come in with the purest of motives and intentions. But uh, the subconscious motivations must be recognized, and then the motivations and intentions must be brought to light and purified. Now, one of the essential features of the monastic life is the eagerness for, for sincerely seeking God. which is ordinarily manifested by one's concrete behavior in regard to his motivation and intentions. So the, the development of the apprentice monk according to the sincerity of seeking, truly seeking God. And he must be developed along these lines. And if there have been motives and intentions that were not really pure at the beginning, they have to be purified so that he would be led along the way of truly seeking God and not seeking himself. The second area for the development program is the seal for the Opus Dei, which means 
the apprentice monk must come to love the common prayer of the community. And the common prayer of the community is the divine office. As so we have seen in the beginning, it's distributed into various hours of the day according to the Roman way of reckoning time. Night time, early dawn, matins, at the rising of the sun, morning prayer or lauds, and then uh, around nine o'clock, mid-morning, then at uh, 12 noon, midday, and then around three, mid-afternoon, and then towards the setting of the sun, uh, vespers or evening prayers, and then night prayers. So the, the apprentice monk must love the prayer, the common prayer of the community. And he prepares for it industriously. And uh, the best way for him to prepare for this uh, love of the common prayer of the community is to Lectio Divina. So part of the development of the, of the monk along this second area is well, he has to love reading Lectio Divina. Now, he, he takes part in the divine office with uh, attention and devotion. And his uh, zeal for the divine office for the Opus Dei is extended throughout his life in constant attention to God and manifested by his posture of recollection and silence. So the, the zeal for the Opus Dei is not limited inside the oratory or the chapel during the praying, the chanting of the divine hours of the the different hours of the divine office. No, it has to be extended in his daily life. And it will be manifested by his uh, constant attention to God, by his posture of recollection and silence. So this is the area. And uh, as one grows in his love for the common prayer of the community, the Opus Dei, the Divine Office, then he uh, acquires a richer perspective of the Word of God and the place of that Word of God in his life. The third uh, area is the area of obedience. Chapter 5 of the Rule Uh, sets the dynamics of obedience and the uh, apprentice monk has to show a zeal for obedience. So obedience to the rule, obedience to the monastic observances, obedience to the abbot, and the leaders of the community. And uh, disobedience has to be prompt and quick, like chapter five uh, says, well, if the monk, the apprentice monk is doing something and is told to do something else, somewhere else, he drops out the work and then he goes to obey. So that there will be a correspondence of the uh, command, the order of the command, and his response by obeying. Now, chapter 71 of the rule uh, talks about mutual obedience, and so this has to be taken into account. 
not the, the monks are to obey one another. Of course, with a very important pri proviso that there has to be a hierarchy of obedience. So obedience. Uh, well, we distinguish two kinds of obedience, you remember? The educative obedience. But as uh, the apprentice monks uh, grows into maturity, maybe he will need less of this educative obedience coming from his abbot, coming from his seniors and so on. But the ascetical obedience to control the self-will and to control the ego and to control all those uh, personal whims and uh, inclinations and tendencies, the ascetical obedience lasts for a lifetime. So this is one area of growing. The fourth area is the area of trials. Is he zealous for trials? Is he eager for trials? The original word used uh, in the Latin of the role is opprobria. O p p r i a b r i a. Opprobria means laborious jobs that people in the world consider humiliating. So laborious jobs that people in the world consider humiliating. They are the humble services by which the monk might learn humility and patience. And these are the unattractive and unpleasant services, the kind of things that were left for the slaves in the ancient world to do. Well, uh, in one sharing, we had a Travis monastery. A priest who entered the monastery, already a priest, was assigned to collect cow manures. And for this priest, he considered that as a kind of a laborious job, opprobrium. And uh, this is the kind of a job that people in the world would call humiliating. Imagine for a priest to be gathering dried cow manures. However, opprobria, laborious jobs that people in the world consider humiliating, does not mean fictitious humiliations devised to test the novice's endurance. So you don't, uh, you don't fabricate situations and fictitious humiliations just to test the, the apprentice monk's endurance. Although it may include bearing insult and injury when they arise spontaneously. And the uh, eagerness for trials, for opprobria, is manifested when a correction is made and thus the apprentice monk accept correction readily and uh, gladly, or he accepts them with resentment. So these are the, the four areas of 
uh, development. In summary, the development of the apprentice monk consists in his growth in humility. So it's, uh, if we talk about the development program, then it's the development of humility, the growth in humility. The eagerness in seeking God and for the Opus Dei corresponds to the first degree of humility. Obedience corresponds to the second, third, fourth degrees of humility and opprobria to the fifth, sixth, and seventh degree of humility. Now, why is there really a need for the apprentice monk to grow in the spiritual program that we have uh, mentioned in the area of uh, uh, truly seeking God, in the seal for the common prayer of the community, the Opus Dei, in the seal, in his seal for obedience and for uh, trials. These facilitate the monks ascend to God, to Christ, to the kingdom of God, to charity and purity of heart. So that's the reason where we have this development program. So the monk must uh, uh, grow spiritually. He must ascend to God higher and higher and higher and higher, to God in Christ, to the kingdom of God, to the perfection of charity, and to that monastic purity of heart. Now, the, the last of the uh, program established by the rule is the lifetime program. The formation of the monk does not stop with the monastic profession, the perpetual profession. It is indeed an ongoing formation throughout a lifetime. And the, the abbot takes care of this ongoing formation program. However, the formative role of the entire community of monks cannot be overemphasized. All the members of the community should be conscious of this formative role of the community which is made up of individual monks. So the ongoing formation program. Well, I'll maybe uh, let's, ta let's take an analogy of the dangers when there is an ongoing formation program. You know, I, uh, I taught for 11 years at the Immaculate Conception School of Theology, and I was teaching spirituality. And there were other subjects given to me, like uh, catechetics and homiletics. And what I have told my students is, ordination to the priesthood is not the end of everything. After ordination and even in the course of the ministry, you have to grow. 
and I had even been challenging them. Well, while you are in the theologate, you are asked to write term papers, you are right, uh, asked to write uh, thesis and to defend them, and you read this and you read that. But they are not meant just to qualify you for ordination. After ordination, you must continue studying, reading, and learning. Otherwise, if you don't, you stagnate. I have been a monk for almost so, five decades. And up to this point in time, I still continue my ongoing formation. I make it a point that in whatever I do, it is done in the spirit of seeking God and not seeking myself and not working for my self-congratulations and self-glorification. The Opus Dei I make it sure that not a single one of the R is neglected. Obedience, stability, patience, which entails sufferings, these are all elements of obedience. And then, the eagerness for humble services in order to learn humility and patience even if they're unattractive and um, unpleasant services or maybe the kind of a work left to the slaves in the ancient world now how do you translate into your life situation the formation of a monk? Well, I, I suggest you take the um, four questions of Benedict as cue. In whatever you do, whether for your family, for the fulfillment, accomplishment of your job, or maybe in your pastoral work, are you truly seeking God? Are you doing it for God or for yourself? Or for others to, you know, to praise you and to appreciate you and to extol you? You are not expected to pray the divine office, although many lay people have now taken all their own, the praying of the divine office, but do you give time for prayer? And do you have specific times to commune with God in prayer? How about obedience? If you are a wife, are you obedient to your husband? If you are a husband, are you obedient to your wife? Children, are you obedient to your parents? Are you obedient to your uh, teachers in school? Take this uh, COVID-19 situation. People are asked to stay home, the quarantine period. 
and where there is uh, more of the elements of the pandemic they are to stay under the lockdown condition but still just the same people disobey some of my friends told me in Manila oh my god during the Mother's Day how so many people went out notwithstanding the rule of quarantine anyhow it uh, Mother's Day comes only once a year and so and I have a friend who owns a delicacy shop and my friend told me oh it was a chaotic day so many came to buy uh, delicacies and cakes and so we had to hurry because there were so many orders and in our haste our cakes even collapsed because there was not enough time to keep them in the refrigerator are you obedient to the rules of the church to the rules of society to the rules of the school to the rules of your family the the eagerness for trials oh we know we Filipinos want white collar jobs and the more humble jobs we don't want to accept them we had a case of two um, students they are junior high school grade uh, 11 they were planning to go to summer job either at the McDonald's in Vegan or Shouting or Jollibee and uh, I said we are in need of some helpers at the garden and at the vegetable garden if you wish you may uh, apply for a summer job but you will not come with the uh, uh, uniforms you will not come speak and span you will have to work at the gardens and perhaps under the heat of the Sun it's not a quite color job would you be willing So these are some of the areas that you can probably explore and especially in the spiritual life in your own formation program for yourself, for your family. It's not just for specific situations or emergency situations. Oh. I was telling some of my friends, priest friends, during this quarantine and lockdown period, now you stay at home, now you have time to pray, now you have time to meditate, now you have time for this and for that, for which you did not have time during your busy ministries. But I hope this will not just be an emergency situation program, but it should be part of your lifetime program so with my presentation of the formation program of the monk look into your own self look into your own family is there really a formation program for your life even after you have been through with your education in school and in the specialized period specialist tasks you have been trained. Growing into the fullness of the life of God in Christ is a lifetime program. And it also needs phases. It also needs periods. It also needs areas. 
for our development and growth in our life in God. The time is up now. Thank you again for your listening uh, patience and I hope to meet you tomorrow at the same time. Goodbye now.